Well, hello and welcome to the podcast from the Huffines Institute for Sports Medicine and Human Performance. I'm your host, Tim Lightfoot, and I am so glad that you took the time to download us and you're taking the time to be with us today as we complete our series about exercise during this time of pandemic. As most of you that have been with us have known, we've been, since we're all social distancing, we haven't been in our regular studio. So our audio and our, our sound quality, our, our video and our audio quality is probably a little bit less than what we you've come to expect, but bear with us is certainly a special time for all of us. And uh, so we're all doing the best we can. And we hope that you've been enjoying and using the information in this series, because that's why we're doing it. Uh, as one reminder, uh, if you need uh, guidelines for how to exercise during the pandemic, check out the little box. It's right down here that'll come up on your screen. That's a linkage to the most recent American College Sports of Sports Medicine guidelines for exercising during the pandemic. And we would certainly encourage you to go ahead and do that. Today, I'm really excited to kind of also close another loop that we started uh, four episodes ago when we were stopped, we talked about when sports stop. We mentioned an author then and a new book that was coming out uh, that talks about uh, sports during another contagion, another pandemic that happened. And so our guest today is Dr. Randy Roberts from Purdue University. Welcome to the podcast, Randy. Well, I'm really happy to be here. Well, we're so excited to have you. We're so excited to have you. Let me uh, give the audience a little bit of introduction on you, and then we'll, uh, we'll just jump right into the conversation. As I said, Dr. Roberts is at uh, Purdue University. Um, he originally got his PhD in history from Louisiana State University. Uh, for those of you that are, are Aggies or future Aggies uh, that are watching this, uh, Dr. Roberts uh, spent some time at Sam Houston State University and the University of Houston in the past, so he's very familiar with Aggieland. Uh, and quite a long list of accolades for Dr. Roberts. Uh, in 2016, he was named the Indiana Professor of the Year. Congratulations. Uh, he's had many other honors, including being named Teacher of the Year by the Society of Professional Journalists. He has uh, been honored with a Distinguished Professor rank at Purdue, as well as recently being named one of the 10 150th anniversary professors at Purdue. Uh, Purdue just had their 150th anniversary and they named one professor from each college as uh, an eminent professor and Dr. Roberts was that uh, from his college there. Uh, Dr. Roberts' uh, research and his uh, scholarship focuses on uh, a variety of different parts of history, but in particular U.S. sports history. He's written many books about the role of sports in American history, including books uh, with Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X, a book about Mickey Mantle, a book about Alabama's football program. Plus, for all you Texas history buffs, he also co-wrote a book on the Alamo that came out in 2001. Now, in an incredible act of precognition, uh, his newest book, which was just released last Tuesday, as a matter of fact, March 24th, is called War Fever, Boston, Baseball, and America in the Shadow of the Great War. Uh, that book deals with baseball, uh, uh, with the fallout from World War I, and as well as part of it is talks about the Spanish flu pandemic that happened in 1918. And so Dr. Roberts, congratulations on the new book. But I, I guess before we get started talking about the new book, I'd really interested to find out when did you start writing? How did you know that this was going to be something that you needed to write about? Well, needless to say, I, I had no precognition. I, I, I'm not clairvoyant. It's just one of those facts that just happened. You know, it, it's, it's timing. And who knows how that stuff happens? But I probably started a book, yeah, maybe about three years ago. I mm -hmm. wrote it with a guy. Uh, one of my former students, a man by the name of Johnny Smith, teaches at Georgia Tech. And what we wanted to do is tell a story of 1918, of America's, America's year in World War I. And we really looked through, looked at three people, uh, three celebrities, a person that was really made by World War I to a great degree, like Babe Ruth, uh, that you're probably familiar with, a person who was destroyed by World War I, a, the German conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, a man by the name of Karl Muck, and uh, a person who was both made and destroyed by World War I, a soldier, Congressional Medal of Honor winner, uh, a man, Harvard Law grad, a Wall Street lawyer by the name of uh, Charles Whittlesey. And so 
it just so happened we take this story really through the year of 1918, little 1917, little 1919, but mostly 1918. And it just so happened that in the in January of 1918, out in Haskell County, Kansas, there there was a flu outbreak, hmm. and it turned out that it was different than other flus, and and it killed. And if I can just mention a couple words about the flu, what will happen? is that flu will travel across the United States, and it's bad, but it doesn't get a great deal of attention. It spreads among soldiers in training camps. Then it goes overseas. And then in the late August of 1918, it will come back to America, and that's when it is the absolute killer pandemic that we know today, a pandemic that killed, we don't know, somewhere between 50 million and 100 million people worldwide killed over, oh, roughly, probably about 675,000 Americans. And so that's, that's in the background of the story. It just so happens the first place it hits in America, the killer pandemic, happens to be Boston at the very beginning of the World Series that year. Yeah, it was interesting I saw in your book that it seems like the World Series started and just had to end it. And when the huge outbreak happened in Boston, do you think because they decided to go ahead and play, that that may have added to the issues or the spread of that? Well, it's interesting because had the World Series been played when it's supposed to be played, late September and early October, it would never have been played because the pandemic was already, you know, the toothpaste was out of the tube, so, so to speak. Um, but it, because of the war, there was a shortened season, and it has to do with the politics of the war. I think Boston that year, played 126 games instead of, uh, I think it was still 154 at that time. Um, so it was played, and, and, and it breaks out just at the beginning of the World Series. So nobody really understands it. And this idea of social distancing that we know today will eventually come about, but not immediately. But does it help spread it? Certainly it helps spread it. But at the same time, there was a huge uh, war bond rally that people congregated for it. Hundreds of thousands of people had, a, had to register for the draft at that time. And so there were a series of events in Boston that brought people together that undoubtedly contributed to the severity of the crisis. So it was, I know this was all wrapped up in, in the end of the war or in the war effort that was going on. Were there some discussions uh, amongst the um, uh, baseball powers that be about whether to go ahead and play, not only because of the war, but because of the pending out or because of the beginning of folks getting sick. Uh, did that ever come into it or, or did they, they shorten the season and it just so happened that right after the season was over, the big pandemic hit? Well, it so happens. The, the, mm. the fear was, first of all, there would be no season. Mm. Then all the way through the season, there was this, this looming uh, order, a worker fight order from the government, which meant the players were either going to have to find defense industry work, uh, go to a shipyard, or they're going to have to go serve in the army. Hmm. And, and finally, it was decided, okay, the work and fight order will go into effect on September 1st, which meant the season had to end by that time. And then two teams, one from National, one from the American, the winners, were given an exemption to play a World Series after that. So the real fear for baseball owners is that the series, that the season wouldn't take place and then the series wouldn't take place. Nobody knew about this pandemic. I mean, you know, something was happening. In late August, three places in the world, it breaks out. It breaks out in Brest, France, which is a place, a deep water port, a lot of ships going in and out of Brest. 40% of American soldiers entered the Western Front at Brest. And so it's, it's, it's a town with a lot of activity. And also in Freeport, Sierra Leone, which is another, it's a harbor, ships from Africa, Asia, Europe are all kind of taking, meeting there and going other places. And, and then the third place is in Boston, again, where so many soldiers left and soldiers came back in and just uh, centers where they would be shipped back and forth. And so this was at the very end of, of August. And then 
the series begins on September 1st. And it takes a while for those, for the disease, which was at first just in, in the service camps to spread to the city. But it had started right as the series started. So did that uh, play over into the uh, next season? Was there some discussion about what to do with the next season or had the pandemic passed through by the time uh, the next season rolled around? Well, this is one of the things we have to, should think a little bit about pandemics today if, if we're mm -hmm. making comparisons. Uh, there, if you look at this pandemic, there's three waves. The first wave was that winter, uh, January, February, and into the spring of, of 1918. Then it kind of disappeared for a while. And mm. then the second wave was when it comes back in late August, 1918. And then it seemed to disappear. And so everybody was out again and everybody was celebrating. And then it comes back again in January, a third wave in January of 1919. Um, it had cleared away though by the time baseball season was due to start that next spring. In that first wave, I, one of the victims it almost claimed was Babe Ruth. Wow. Wow. It, now, I, I didn't realize because a lot of your book talks about Babe Ruth. I mean, he's one of the main characters in that. Did, and how did that affect him? How Did that experience affect him at all? Or did it um, just add to his legend? Well, this was in May, mm. May of 1918. So it's that first outbreak. Mm. And he just shows up at the ballpark. He's supposed to pitch. I mean, remember, Babe Ruth going into 1918 was not a batter. He was not a home run hitter. He was probably the best left-handed pitcher in baseball. Hmm. Uh, it's only because of the war. You know, the Boston lost 11 players to the draft. They had no, no hitters. And Babe Ruth fancied himself as a pitcher that could hit. And he swung for the fences all the time. And this is before home runs. In, in, at this time in baseball, a home run was a fluke. Nobody tried to hit home runs. You know, this was small ball baseball. This was, you know, old school, dead ball air. You know, you tried to chop down and hit singles. You tried to bunt and get the first that time. And so here we have Babe Ruth saying, you know, I'm, he's calling his shots. You know, he's telling people, I'm going to hit the next one out of the park, and he'll hit the next one out of the park. I mean, he had a couple called shots that year, literally. And so he's coming to pitch. He's still pitching. He's got 104 temperature. He's sick. His, you know, he, he, his bones ache, he, you know, every part of him, he's got a hacking cough, all the signs of the flu. And so his manager says, uh, babe, you're not pitching today. You know, and, okay, he doesn't pitch. And they take him to a doctor. And the doctor looks at him, thinks there's something wrong with his throat, obviously. So um, at that time, they would paint your throat with a silver nitrate solution. Mm. And it was very... It could be effective, but it could be dangerous. If you painted it too liberally, if it dripped down into your throat, it could cause edema, which is swelling, and it could even lead to death. And sure enough, they put too much on Babe, and he became, he became extraordinarily ill, had to be checked in immediately to the emergency room of the hospital. Uh, there were rumors and articles in the newspapers that he was close to death, that he was on his deathbed. Uh, how close he was to death, I don't know. But there were certainly rumors. And then eventually he overcomes it. And then he gets in, a, in later in October, he gets the flu again. So he truly was a salt in a swat. He, he could survive anything. Wow. So he, so he really experienced it twice. Well, one of now, the, what, although what, I think he, he dies of lung cancer. I mean, of throat yeah. cancer, doesn't he? So who knows? Whoa. I didn't speculate about that, but I don't know. Maybe that's where it started. You know, one of the things I find interesting in your book, just con contrasting it to what's going on now, is that I, I believe you talk about there was some politi politicization of the flu, I think. But didn't you, didn't you report that the New York Times was even referring to it as the German flu as opposed to the Spanish flu? Yeah, you're absolutely right. They talked about it as the German flu. They thought it was a secret weapon. Remember, World War I was a time of secret mm -hmm. weapons, of chlorine gases and mustard gases and other poisonous gases. And this, you know, there were rumors that some submarine had come and they had released it on the shores of Boston, uh, which was, there were always rumors, and sometimes true rumors, uh, that there were uh, submarines off the coast of Cape Cod and close to Boston, and, uh, and there, there were submarines patrolling the Atlantic coast. Um, so yeah, the, there was rumors, and, and also in the newspapers, 
The one thing about a pandemic, you know, there are several things that are conclusions I draw. Is first is you can't manage the truth. Okay, there is an attempt to manage the truth. If you look at the newspapers, one same day you'll have an article saying pandemic spreading out of control, and then next to it will be an article pandemic is is losing force, is almost gone. You know what's the truth? Nobody knew, and and and, and the government wasn't very helpful at giving the truth. So there's all sorts of different rumors and half truths that are floating around, which is which is not a very good thing. The other thing, conclusion I drew was don't be so quick to declare victory. The mm -hmm. flu dealing with a, a pandemic is not like playing a baseball game where you finish your nine innings and somebody's ahead and, and you declare a winner. Uh, you don't know when this thing is gone. It, it plays by its own rules. Yeah, and it's interesting how we seem to be relearning those lessons all, of, all over again. I mean, we're repeat, almost literally repeating history in that aspect. Yeah, was it Mark Twain one time said, you know, if, if history doesn't repeat itself, at least it echoes. I, I can certainly hear the echo of 1918. Yeah. Now, we haven't really talked much about the, the, the influence of the war on baseball, and that really is, seems to be the focus of your book. It's fascinating to see how you, you bring up the story of the conductor of the Boston uh, Symphony Orchestra, and who was German, I believe, who really faced a lot of backlash because of his heritage. Right, the Karl Muck. Mm. He, um, he, he was accused, falsely accused, I mm. might say. They, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, which was the creme de la creme of symphony orchestras in the United States, and many of their, many of their performers, of the people in the orchestra, were from Germany, mm. including the conductor. And they played a, they played a, a, a gig, if you will, in, in uh, Providence. And afterwards, he was accused of refusing to play the national anthem. He didn't, hmm. US national anthem. He didn't refuse. It wasn't on the playlist. Nobody asked him to play it. He just, it, it just wasn't played for, for he ne they never played it. And so he was accused of being, uh, you know, being disloyal. Then he's accused of being a spy. Okay, he wasn't a spy. He didn't love America. He was a German. He hoped that Germany would win the war. There's no question about it. I'm not talking about this guy as a patriotic American who's accused of being a spy. But there's one thing with having, you know, feeling something for Germany and for your heritage, and he was a friend of the Kaiser. It's another thing to be a spy, and he wasn't a spy. But then they find out that investigating him, that he had a number of affairs with American women, and he, and the end result is he ends up in a detention camp down in uh, outside of Chattanooga in Georgia, in a place called Oglethorpe, that's a uh, relocation camp, or detention camp, excuse me. It just goes to show they start digging and they'll find, they'll find that stuff, won't they? Well, yeah, it does. And it, it points out the problematic nature of civil liberties in a, in a national crisis. When they come head to head against each other, uh, you know, you know who's going to win. <laughs> Civil Liberties is not going to win. Yeah. Uh, once again, that's a, an echo of what's happening now, it sounds like, or what may be yeah. happening now. Yes. So, so the third character in your book was, I, I think many people don't remember uh, this gentleman or much about the, the circumstances he found himself in, but this gentleman, I believe, Charles Whittlesley, found himself, he was the uh, commander of the Lost Battalion. Uh, in the Oregon forest. Can you just I guess, give the, the, the audience a little bit of background about that to help refresh their memory about why he was important for your book? Charles Whittlesey is a name that when I mention him today, I just get blank looks on my face, mm -hmm. on people's faces. At the time, in the 19, right after World War I, uh, Charles Whittlesey was the most famous American uh, soldier from, from, from World War One. I. I mean, you had Pershing who was commanding the troops, but Charles Wilsey was the first American awarded an, an, a Congressional Medal of Honor in World War One. just a Medal of Honor. He was, um, he, he, he was the most unlikely military hero. Like I said, he was a scholar. He had gone to Williams, a very good school. He had gone to Harvard Law School. He was a, a he, he, for a while, he was a socialist. He was a Wall Street lawyer. But, when the Lusitania was sunk, 
he he felt patriotic. Okay, he was like Whittlesey's had fought in every war since the Pequot War back in the colonial era, and so he went. He trained to be an officer. He became an officer. Uh, again, he doesn't look it. He's tall, long-legged. They called him the stork, okay, because the way he marched around campus. And but in the moves, they're gone offensive, which is an offensive most Americans maybe have never heard about. But it's the largest military offensive in in American history. He was given an order. The offensive wasn't going well at first, and he was given an order to lead a battalion size force. It wasn't a single battalion. It was a mixture, but a battalion size force and to, and to reach a certain point. And he was told, don't worry about casualties. Don't worry about your flanks. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. The, the units on either side of him didn't. So he was way out front. He was quickly surrounded by the Germans. He went in with about 700 people into the pocket. When they were finally, when the Germans were finally forced to pull back, less than 200 were able to walk out of it. Wow. Yeah. And he comes home. And he's a hero. Supposedly, well, not supposedly, he was given, Germans sent him a, a surrender letter. You know, so for the sake of humanity, we can hear what's going on. They're down at the bottom of a ravine in what's called the pocket. And this is an area that I've tramped across several times, more than several times, you know, a number of times in France. And I'm talking about it is steep. To get up out of this pot, I mean, you, you can't walk out of it. You got to grab a tree to hold on to a bush, or you're going to slide back down into it. And they're down there, and, and people are dying of gangrene. They're running short of ammunition. They have no medical supplies. They have no food. They had gone in without coats, without blankets. It, 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 it's the worst of the worst. And, and supposedly, the Germans, not supposedly, they sent a letter saying, for the sake of humanity, we can hear the suffering surrender. And the rumor was, Whittlesey said, go to hell. And he becomes known as go to hell Whittlesey. It's kind of like, remember the Alamo. It's one of those things that people, hell with Spain, remember the main type of thing. He never said it. He did. But that's what he became famous for. And so he goes home. He's an immediate hero. He's also probably unquestionably suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, and and he's, his only concern is his soldiers fighting under him. When he's interviewed afterwards, by, when, as soon as he comes out of the pocket by reporters at the camp, you know, he says, look, please don't write about me. Write about my soldiers. He doesn't want this. And eventually he becomes uh, the honorary pole bearer of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And he's being, he, 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 it's almost like he can't live with what happened. Well, I'll leave, I'll leave the story there. The reader can uh, pick up the story from there. I don't want to give the end away. Well, and, but that's the fascinating thing. I think we have so much history that we have forgotten, so much incredibly important history in people. And we, we tend to maybe remember people who don't deserve to be remembered. But those folks like that that did heroic things and didn't want the attention um, somehow get missed or get passed over. That's right. that's right. Unless something happens where their memory survived. For example, with Whittlesey, at the exact same time as Whittlesey, uh, virtually within days of each other, when Whittlesey is on a Moose Aragon offensive, uh, fighting in the pocket, 10 miles away maybe in the same offensive, is another guy who's going about heroics, a person by the name of Alvin York. So today, most of us have heard of Sergeant York. But Sergeant York wasn't as famous as Whittlesey after the war. Sergeant York becomes famous in what was the movie made in 39 or 40, I think it was 1940, when, they, when Gary Cooper plays him in the movie uh, on uh, Sergeant York. And so he becomes really, for us today, in our memory, if we've heard of any soldier from World War I, it's Sergeant York. But again, that's a product of Hollywood and almost a generation later. Hey, once again, how the media perceives us and how we're presented, I guess, is what leads to memories, huh? Exactly right. Yeah. Well, Randy, I, I want to thank you for your time today. It's been great. Um, we want to wish you the best with your book. Uh, regular listeners of our podcast know that we always give our speakers a chance at the end to give one take-home message. So if, there's, if people forget everything else about this podcast, what's the one thing you want them to remember? I guess mostly is we have been through crises before. If you study American history, if you study any history, you study crises. 
And, and you study in American history, it's about overcoming crises. You know, it's, it's the Texians at, at the Alamo and afterwards, the ending up in San Jacinto. It's Americans in World War I and World War II. It's battalions caught off in World War I. It's in Korea, the people up at the Chosan Reservoir and able to fight their way back under Chesty Polar. That we have been through crises before. We've overcome crises. We are now in a crisis now, and we will overcome it as well. That is a fabulous take-home message and a great way to more or less conclude our, our mini-series about exercise during the pandemic and what's going on. And so thank you so much for your time. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in and, and downloading us and watching us. Uh, certainly, I thank you for all the comments that you've sent us, all the, the, the wonderful comments that you've sent us. Please continue to send those. Uh, let your friends know about these podcasts. They are meant to inform, uh, to help you understand what's going on and help you understand what science and how science knows what's going on and that it is safe to exercise. I would remind you again that if you need those guidelines on how to exercise safely during the pandemic, we have the URL right here for the ACSM guidelines. Feel free to pull that down and uh, look it over. We also on the front page of our website at huffinesinstitute.org. We also have links not only to that guideline guidance, but also to the guidance from the World Health Organization for exercise as well. So it's certainly safe to exercise. We usually end our broadcast by saying stay active and stay healthy, but certainly we've adopted all the other things that go along right now with staying healthy and that is uh, certainly wash your hands repeatedly, cough into your elbows, practice social distancing, and certainly stay health, stay active so you can stay healthy. So join us next time when we have another interesting person in the world of sports medicine. And until then, please do stay healthy.